It is nice to see everybody again. I hope everyone's ready with their hats and water <laughs> for our second day of touring. From great. the comfort of your own home. <laughs> um, great to have you with us, Uri. Um, maybe, um, first of all, um, on behalf of our temple, um, we want to send condolences and lots of support um, to everyone in Medinat Israel in the state of Israel who is mourning the death of um, 45 individuals who um, were tragically killed in a celebration, supposed to be a celebration of uh, Lagba Omer, um, this, this one day between, uh, <laughs> between the second day of Passover and Shavuot, which was supposed to be this day of music and celebration and ended up in, in great tragedy. Um, we understand, Uri, that um, uh, today is a, is a, has been um, declared a national day of mourning. And while you know we're not going to spend too much of our time talking about that, we just wanted to um, let you know that we, our hearts are with you um, and with the greater Israel community. Um, however, we observe how, whatever kinds of Jews we are. Kol Aravim Zebazeh, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh. All Israel is. We are responsible for one another. We care for one another. Um, so maybe you could tell us briefly, Ori, how this day is 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 kind of being conducted. I know you're at the latter half of the day in Israel right now, um, but uh, what does a national day of mourning look like in Israel today? Well, actually, we don't have we don't have a lot of these. The last uh, national day of mourning that was instituted was when. Um, uh, Shimon Peres passed away in 2016, former president and many other things <laughs> in the history of Israel. Uh, it, what it looks like and what was decided upon is that uh, flags would be at half mask at, in the Knesset, in the parliament building and also on military bases. Schools shifted their curriculum for today, either entirely revolving, I think the city of Jerusalem focused entirely on the events that took place and what people might be feeling. Um, but in other parts of the country, there were designated talks by homeroom teachers with the classes talking about the various facts, first of all, with the younger grades, uh, as well as, as a moment for people to talk. Uh, now, the truth is, is that this revolved a particular community, a ultra-Orthodox and in specifically a, a Hasidic uh, community, uh, as it is is really highlighted as part of the Hasidic tradition of going up to Mount Meron. And yet, so so what I'm saying is there wasn't a lot of uh, personal relations with and connections with people who were not part of that world. And yet, obviously, uh, we all feel the pain and of course the ages that range from nine to to uh, as the youngest to uh, to a senior adult uh, is, a, is, a very, is a painful, well, it's painful. And that's why well, I'll leave it at that. So that's what it looks like. The the scheduling for the for TV shows has changed. Sporting events have been postponed. Um, music on the radio is, is more subdued, similar to what we would have on our National Memorial Day. Um, so that's that's kind of the feel of what what's going on here. And again, without forgetting and without uh, pushing aside, it's part of who we are, and we move forward, and we, or we continue to move forward. It's with us, of course, which is what we're going to do now. Thank you for um, for letting us know. I know you know we all had, um, heard that that today was going to be that kind of day. We didn't always know what that was going to look like. Yeah. Um, and um, but we we for John, um, I wanted to uh, as we did two weeks ago, Ori, just take a moment and introduce you. Um, Ori Feinberg has been a Jewish educator for 25 years. Um, he was born in the United States, and that's why. He has such a non-detectable Israeli accent. <laughs> no problem, uh, Rabbi Josh. If you want, I talk like this the whole time. They know for sure I'm Israeli. No problem. My English, very good. That's amazing. That's amazing how you can just shift like that. Um, and uh, but, so he was born in the United States uh, or he immigrated to Israel. He is an Ole Hadash um, when he was 10. Um, and they grew up in Jerusalem and he served in the IDF and then traveled the world as so many Israelis do. Um, Uri has a master's degree from the Hebrew University in com contemporary, Ju contemporary Jewish studies as a Jewish history teacher for North American teens. God bless you. 
and in semester programs in Israel for many years. Uri spent three years in the United States and his wife and three daughters, where he served as the interim director of education at Temple Israel in Boston. A licensed tour guide since 1999, Ori has worked as a tour educator for a wide range of groups, including synagogues like ours. He has guided Jewish heritage trips throughout Europe, has lectured on Israel, Jewish identity across North America. And, um, and now um, what Ori has done in this period of pandemic has reharnessed um, his, his passion for teaching and, and is doing that online. He continues to reach out and partner with um, lots of communities he's connected with. And, um, and he's guiding over Zoom. Ori and his family live in the city of Modi'in, are active members of a reform congregation there, Yotzma. And Ori's experience um, has been driven by a clear desire to share the power of the land and state of Israel, strengthen Jewish identity and connection with the Jewish people. Um, he's a special guy. We've had the opportunity to have him lead a couple of um, uh, family trips in Israel, which has been um, such a, a real treat. And um, I would just add before, or you take it away, uh, for those of you who are so happy you're joining us on Zoom or on Streamcast, um, we just ask that you mute um, yourselves. Um, and we're gonna just make sure that there's some time at the end um, for some, um, some Q&A, some questions. But in the meantime, we just ask that you um, remain muted because Ori's going to take us guiding. Um, yes. Which is very exciting. So, Ori, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Rabbi. It is a pleasure to be with all of you again. And I'm glad to be back. Uh, this is our second of two um, days that we're going to spend together. Uh, days in the sense that it's about an hour and 15 minutes <laughs> all together, where we will now tackle continue to tackle this idea of trying to find places, even if you've been to Israel before, places that maybe you haven't seen, or maybe there are people you haven't yet met, because we are going to meet a few people along the way today, and we'll have a chance to engage in a different layer of Israel. Both, I'll share some information for sure, but it's always good to hear people on the ground, and maybe people who more authentically actually sound like this when you talk to them. Uh, because again, while most of my life has been here in Israel and this ability to go back and forth be be between accents perhaps is a reflection of my inability to, to figure out who I am. Uh, but of course, isn't that where we are all at at times? So today we're going to be going off the beaten path and yet also focusing like last week was on Jerusalem. This week will be in the city of Tel Aviv, although maybe we'll pick up where we left off last week. So I'm gonna jump right ahead. Once again, uh, we're gonna be using Zoom and Google Earth. Those of you who are familiar know that it can be a little disorienting once you're flying over. So you might wanna look away. Uh, and then once we land, then we'll hit the ground running. At times using the Google Earth platform to use the 360 degree view to describe what we see. And at times, well, meeting some guides on the ground for us as we speak. If there's any, any problem, if I freeze, Rabbi, let me know, and we are off. So here we go. Let me share my screen. One, two, three, and four. And we're going to, of course, pick up the bus because we can't travel to Israel without picking up the bus. So a place that's very familiar to all of you. Hopefully you will all be back in the synagogue soon enough but I, you know what? I don't see the bus anywhere. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, we, you know what, we're not even gonna wait. I think we're just gonna take off because I don't, I do see a porta potty there, but I don't see the bus. So what we're gonna do is just fly away and make our way all the way to the state of Israel. It's always a good idea to pause for a moment before we jump right into it and to remind ourselves, of course, of the map of Israel. We see it very nicely here from our satellite view. We know of a history that, well, if we want to go back 4,000 years to the days of Abraham and Sarah, we can talk about the tradition of them traveling via the uh, the Fertile Crescent, right, from the area of the Tigris and the Euphrates, Mesopotamia, that region. We are in the cradle of civilization between the Nile River over here and the Tigris and the Euphrates, and this Fertile Crescent, which would have been 
part of the main highway and byway of antiquity, and regardless of Abraham and Sarah, can give us a sense of why was that monotheistic faith so ready and ripe to be born in this bridge across civilization. Now, we could, of course, spend a whole day just talking about that, but we won't, because we are going to focus in on our journey today, which is going to take us to the city of Tel Aviv. But having said that, we do want to start, as I mentioned, where we left off. And if you remember last week, or the last time we met, two weeks ago, we were at Mount Herzl. And we'll just get off of our bus that we can see right over here very nicely. And we're about to go into the main entrance over here of Mount Herzl. Last time we were together, just to remind you, and perhaps some of you may not have been with us, we were at a different part of Mount Herzl, which was the military cemetery, the National Military Cemetery of the State of Israel, also located in Mount Herzl, uh, situated slightly below the main entrance that we're going to go in now. And that's not to say that the burial site of Theodor Herzl, who we'll learn more about and remind ourselves more about, is more important than the soldiers who are buried along the northern slopes of the mountain. In fact, if anything, perhaps the opposite is true, or at least they're in conjunction, because without a top cannot exist without the sides of that mountain holding it strong. And in fact, there is some thought behind the madness. But we're going to now separate ourselves from the military cemetery, enter in through these gates. If anyone needs the restroom, they're straight ahead and to the right. And then we're going to make our way up a path that will bring us, to, well, you know what? I believe our guide is waiting for us. So why don't we begin? Mount Herzl is named for Theodore Benjamin Zev Herzl, who in 1897 wrote in his journal following the first World Zionist Congress in Basel, which he convened. He wrote, were I to sum up the Basel Congress in a word, which I shall guard against pronouncing publicly, it would be this. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. If not in five years, certainly in 50 years, everyone will know it. He wrote this in 1897. In 1947, the United Nations says yes to a partition plan, which essentially says yes to a Jewish state. Can you hear it? Australia, yes. Belgium, yes. Bolivia, yes. Brazil, yes. When I come up here, I think to myself, what would Herzl have said about our wonderful state? Have we succeeded? Is this what he envisioned? Just behind me, you can see Theodor Herzl's grave right over there. This whole area actually is being built up for the Independence Day celebrations. They're going to happen very soon. I know that in just a few weeks, there's going to be great celebrations here. There's going to be parades, leaders of our state, leaders of our society, invited guests, soldiers, and civilians are all going to fill with pride at the wonder which is the state of Israel. But Israel is much more than just Jerusalem. In fact, did you know that the Declaration of Independence wasn't signed in Jerusalem? Well, that's, that's nice to know, because what we're going to do is make our way to the place where it was signed. Obviously, this idea of celebrating on Independence Day in the way that we do can, well, on the one hand, be very obvious. On the other hand, as you know, Independence Day begins just as Memorial Day comes to an end. Again, that mourning that we feel and then celebration, we're supposed to turn on a dime. Uh, cruel and unnecessary punishment, perhaps, or perhaps part of our Jewish tradition. We know, of course, of the Shiva, where we uh, have stages of mourning, the seven days or the 30 days or the 11 months, the 12 months, uh, the yearly yard site. We know that we don't forget even when we get up out of our Shiva. Perhaps to a certain degree, Memorial Day and Independence Day are intertwined not too differently than that notion. But we're not here to talk about that. Rather, we're going to fly now to, well, that area where that declaration was signed. Now, had this not been an off-the-beaten-path tour of Tel Aviv, then we may very well have landed right here in the ancient port of Jaffa. It could be that I might say, oh, well, this is a place that everybody comes to, and therefore a great starting point, a place that has thousands of years of history, and yet maybe more important is to talk about what happens at the end of the 19th century, when Jews are returning during the first waves of immigration. 
Or perhaps we can talk about the fact that, as you can see, this uh, image that I took out of my backpack is the fact that, that Jaffa is an ancient archaeological tell, a mound of civilization built on civilization going back 5,000 years. We could even open up the Bible and tell the stories of King Solomon, how he sailed the cedars of Lebanon down and took the, sh the lumber off of the ships in Jaffa and up to Jerusalem in order to build the first temple. Not to mention, if we skip through the Bible, we could talk about Jonah, who was running from God's intention that he go to Nineveh to tell the people there to be nicer to each other. Well, we know the whole Pinocchio story. But of course, it's the 19th century that we really would want to focus on if, in fact, this was a first-timer's trip because it is going to be this gateway that will allow for the return of Jews. There were Jews still living in the land since antiquity who never left, but there was going to be a shift with the birth of Zionism that would bring us to Tel Aviv. And of course, which wasn't yet in existence, and the city that predated Tel Aviv would be Jaffa. It predated Jaffa, Tel Aviv by about 5,000 years. Now, obviously, this is not your first timer's tour. And if it was, you might very well find yourself at this overview in ancient Jaffa overlooking the modern city of Tel Aviv. <laughs> but of course, we don't have to really talk about that because, well, if we were back uh, 130 years ago, or 120 years ago, or even 110 years ago, and we would be looking at that view, at this view right now, the sand dunes that would become the city of Tel Aviv. All of this is very nice. And in fact, this particular picture from the 1940s into the 1950s even, gives us from the exact spot that we were standing before, a view of what Tel Aviv looked like even before all the big hotels were built. Now, while I'm a big fan of the first timer tour, it's also nice when we can engage in a site and peel back even deeper layers. While there's lots of rich history in Israel, a great place to come to would be the beach. You know what? Sometimes people come to Israel just to go to the beach. Forget about Jerusalem even, because the tension between the two cities sometimes has it where Tel Avivis will claim this is the real Israel. This Mediterranean shore trumps anything that Jerusalem has to offer because Jerusalem is outdated. This city is what our forefathers and mothers intended when they were talking about a New York of the Middle East as they called it back a hundred plus years ago. And the city that never sleeps, the big orange, the, well, the fact that the second largest city in Israel at 450,000 people, that's about 52 square kilometers, that is about half the size of the city of Jerusalem, even a little smaller than Jerusalem, half the size of Jerusalem, but during the workday blossoms to a million and a half, is going to be the heart of our economy, the heart of our culture. It's going to be here that we have a pride parade that rivals anything in Europe. There's so much to talk about Tel Aviv in that sense that we could just enjoy a view on the beach and have a wonderful week. But you're not here to do that because you can't exactly have a warm beach in Cleveland, but there's other people that I want you to meet. So what we're going to do is we're going to hop over now to a neighborhood that really is off the beaten path and not a lot of people get to, at least not a lot of tourists. And we're now here on uh, uh, Rabbi Frankel Street in Florentine. Florentine is the name of the neighborhood that we're in. It's actually a neighborhood that was started back in those early days of Zionism that we just mentioned because we didn't want to focus on it because it's not a first timer's trip. But it was during that period of time where Jews who were arriving from Saloniki, from Greece, and other Sephardic areas would begin to populate the city of, well, even before it was a city called Tel Aviv. And this was one of those first neighborhoods where those Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews would settle. But today, you know what? There's a lot I could tell you. I know around here somewhere is a gentleman that I'd like you all to meet. And he's going to be with us for about 15 minutes and give us 
well, another perspective on what the city of Tel Aviv has to offer, and in particular, what does Florentine neighborhood have to offer us? I think what we're going to find, if last week we mentioned something called the Western Wall, and we understood that the Western Wall, in fact, is a wall that provides a platform for us to engage with on different levels, I think we're going to find, in Florentine in particular, well, different kinds of walls that also allow us different perspectives. So let's keep our eyes open around here somewhere. I know our guide is there, and he's going to be with us for about 15 minutes. I think this is it. Good to see you. Welcome to the new place. Thank you, thank you. It looks great. I actually just moved in. This is my latest project. Um, and just now you decided to move here. What, what happened in this past... So I'll just tell you, this is my friend Nero Taub, uh, who is an artist himself. Uh, a few other things as well. And he was happy to speak with me so I could share with you, again, different perspectives. Here ...that caused you to want to... That's be within your canvas. It's actually a, kind of like a love-hate situation. But as an Israeli and a Jewish, you know, I'm all the time want to feel the real hummus and the real thing. It's not just the food, it's also the chutzpah, the vibe, the attitude. And Florentine neighborhood, specifically in Tel Aviv city, um, this is a place to be because it's all the time dealing with the new thing that's coming. Full of hype, young people, very loud at night, but actually this is the most colorful neighborhood in the country. Are you, are you more of an artist? Are you more of a guide? Are you an educator? Is it a, why do you do what you do? It's an interesting question. Um, I started my life as an artist. And then understand that one of the platform to express your thoughts, your ideas, and maybe to change other people's perspective to a better way of living, and this is where the educator is coming in, um, was moving into the tour guide. The tour guides that actually want to share their own local life, because now it's all about the individual. I want to show you the authentic perspectives. We all the time want to meet the locals. We want to taste the real Kneidalach or Chraime, you know, the real one and not the one that we see in the shops. And the opportunity to meet someone and getting inside his house and see how they live and, and to see what they're thinking on the wall is changed completely um, the way I look at graffiti and street art. Because it's not just really nice, cute painting to make it a hip coffee shop. It's actually a whole way to express the opinions of the society in the place you visit. And us, the Israel Society... So I'm just going to add... As we go through, you'll see that I'm sharing some of the graffiti that's on the wall. And soon we're going to go for a walk with Nero. But where there is Hebrew, I've translated it as well. So if you, even if you, we don't get to all of them, at least you'll have a sense of some of the language. And if you have any questions about any of them, you can even jot down some of the English and that will remind me of it. And you can come back and say, well, I didn't get it all. But what was the one about if I am not for myself, something? Because there are also cultural references for some of these, uh, from some of the graffiti art. This one, by the way, if I am not for myself, who will bring me love? Is a play on a, well, a traditional and historic claim and statement uh, said by Rabbi Hillel, if I'm not for myself, who am I? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So it's an interesting take, for example. Love these, uh, love this perspective, or, ooh, sorry. I'm sorry? No, no, I, I, I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to say that um, that was one of the things that was just so incredibly like impactful, was getting a sense of the culture through this graffiti and the manipulation of poetry, that traditional poetry, pious poetry, and turning it on its head and being very provocative with it. So any event, just wanted to add that, but I'm excited for the tour. Sure. And you can see this one that we just stopped on, of course. <laughs> I believe, Anima Amina. Uh, again, this, this notion, by the way, Anima Amina in the feminine form as well. Interesting. 
And I think that's what I found so interesting when I'm um, taking the knowledge of the artwork, the scene, the icon, the representative of images, and how to connect to the culture, to, um, to the story of religion that we have in our country, which is really, really intense. And the opinion we got in this... By the way, this is a synagogue in Florentine, a very secular neighborhood. But it's interesting, this is not an actual cobweb, but rather graffiti art, street art, somebody went up there and put this cobweb there, clearly trying to make a statement as well, even though the synagogue exists and it's there, it's used. This thing called religion, how Jew am I, Jewish, and, and what is kosher, and what do you think if you're not eating kosher, all these questions, um, it's very interesting for uh, Jewish people that are living abroad from Israel. Israel is the Jewish land. It's the only Jewish state in the world. That means it's a different kind of uh, attitude, and the chutzpah is different here, and the fears um, are also changing compared to some that live abroad, I think. And it's not about just writing the text of what I really think. This is so Facebook kind of style. It's the visual way to attract you between a whole pile of images and make you connect to your own opinion, or maybe give you a different perspective of your own opinion as it is. Wow, so it's, it, it's almost as if we come here to Florentine for a real Yadar Adofik, a hand on the pulse of where we're at right now. Exactly, and the wanted painting on the wall is not representing a whole scale of, of people or an opinion. This is an individual opinion, and when I write my name on the wall, nobody knows who am I? And this is what make it a place that I can say whatever. We mentioned Theodor Herzl before. Again, this is a play on Herzl's famous statement, Im tirzu enzo agada, if you will it, it is not a dream. And clearly what we see here is the image of Herzl. Lo rotsim, lo tzarich. It didn't really translate exactly as I wrote it. Don't want, then forget it. Literally, it's you don't want, then you, then you don't need. I want without any censorship, but also there's again a big, big range of opinions on the wall, and this is what I said the real thing. So, you know, what, what makes Israel so unique, one I think is that it it really allows us a place like this to have a, have a sense of what's happening right now. We're constantly pushing the envelope and startup nation and all that, but there's another layer to it because of the depth of history and the past and the roots that we have here. So here's my question. What are your roots? What, where did you come from that allowed you to be who you are? Now okay, very interesting. So um, my story uh, is actually coming from Batyam City, which is a, a city nearby, like a neighborhood, let's say, like, like um, Williamsburg and New York, just across the bridge. Um, but it, it have a whole different way of living. It's not really a high, a president with the luxury um, gardens and stuff. Uh, it was kind of hard and hustle, but I all the time came to Florentine because this is the closest neighborhood to where I lived. But it's also very young and hype. Um, I was an artist every time. I all the time did something, I don't know, because I want my Jewish mom to look at what I do, but this is the way of showing things. And this is, I think, my perspective. Um, I grew up in the scouts. And in school, of course, when you're doing your um, exam and everything, everything is learning about the Israel society. Um, but I want to tell you a secret because what's really funny, uh, <laughs> when I finished school, I didn't have good grades in history, okay? Um, the history of Israel, which called Ta'ai, Tordot Am Israel, history and heritage, which I hated, and also um, English. All of this stuff, I failed. Mm -hmm. Even geography, I wasn't really good. And it's kind of ironic, what really turned it to be a tool guide? So my mom and dad wasn't really into Judaism. They were really against it because of all the fear and the drama. Um, it was totally secular. I remember that I was telling you about praying for them just to do their Kiddush, not praying because it's not the wrong <laughs> for them, but you know, just let's do a Kiddush. It's all about the Mishpucha, it's all about the chicken. Let's eat together, let's do the stuff. And I felt like they don't really want to do it because they felt, because again, a lot of the story of um, Chiloni, mm -hmm. which is the secular Jews, is no, no, because this country is the only Jewish state, don't mix this with, the, with me. Um, so I was really against it, but only after, in the army, 
I was really starting to understand this. And just to meet different people in the Israeli society, you know, it's a melting pot. And this has gave me a different perspective. Um, and also to learn about the other. Mm -hmm. To see that, you know, there's another way to live your life. Sure. And, and this is what I was fascinated. I was joining to the Jewish agency. And I become actually to as a proper Zionist uh, back in the time, uh, still Zionist, but again today is post post Zionism. It's so retro to be Zionist. <laughs> but actually, the idea is um, how can I tell about Israel from the Israeli perspective, not just the Jewish perspective of all this tour, because Israel is also falafel and hummus and the chutzpah and going to the beach and screaming in the street when you're not really wrong sure. what you do. And more than one kind of Israeli. Exactly, it's a whole spectrum of yeah. Exactly, colors, or, uh, all the colors in the world. And actually that's what moved me to be very excited about from one perspective, l l show to people my own perspective of life as an Israeli, mm -hmm. doing the army and you know, growing up and even be a shaliach, an Israeli emissary in New York, in Young Judea movement, mm -hmm. and to show them how can I get my, my oomph of the Israeli into the Judaism of there. Because we all the time think here that the Jewish people on the other side, that they're not Israeli, they're a bit old fashioned. This is our mistake because Israelis don't know their communities. They sure. don't know what is really happening. They don't know what is reform Judaism too much, which is an issue for this country as well. And I think with all of this stuff around me, I understand that I, as an artist, want to show the variety. I want to show the spectrum of colors. Uh -huh. You don't have to agree, but you need to understand there's another perspective to how people live their life. And you mentioned perspective, and you chose this apartment for a reason. Exactly. Maybe show us, can we see the perspective you have? Of the neighborhood. This place, okay, because this is looking over the main street that become kind of like um, a closed street at night when all the bars are going on. It's like a, totally you're in Greece, okay, you're like dancing in the street. Uh, but what I'm really fascinated, fascinated about is actually, again, the street art, what people think is vandalism and just writing on the wall, I actually quite excited. I don't know if you know this piece. This is actually belong to Kislev. You can see his signature at the bottom. And this is exactly the basic story in Israel, the conflict between the Palestinian and the Israeli slash Jewish people that live right here. Um, on the left, you can see Solik. Solik is the Jewish Israeli pioneer, the kibbutznik. He got his bucket hat and his sandals and his shorts, and he's building the new land of Israel. The new state of Israel. He's hugging Handala, which is the Palestinian character, right? And as you can see, they're both hugging happy, happy, joy, joy. Why? We are in hipster Tel Aviv. This is the place of love and try to be kind of like um, liberal and to show. So again, you can see what I wrote there, but at the same time, we also seem to mourn or pray together or alongside of each other. Nero was really focused on the one hand, yes, of the pluralism that can be found in Tel Aviv, and yet even on the walls, as we spoke and we walked through, you have images like this one. A, a Jewish woman, an Arab woman, a Muslim woman perhaps, hard to tell exactly. Are they praying? Are they mourning? But this too finds its way on the walls. To everyone, you know, that everything is cool. And I think now, uh, Israel's, Israelis are, are not shy to share their opinion. And uh, back in the 90s, when there was a lot of uh, explosions and terrorism that was going on, there was, a, there was a painful slogan or bumper sticker, no Arabs, no attacks. Uh, and then, again, there's a play on that. You want good hummus, then you have to have Arabs with you. So uh, trying to look at it from this different angles. This is what's so amazing about this piece. And not only that, that's actually on the walls for seven or eight years. There's been no one actually climbing all the way to do something against it. Um, we're trying to accept the others. We're trying to be colorful and party and celebrate life because we know that a lot of stuff that's happening in Jerusalem with religion and politics and again, all the tension, the city of Tel Aviv is going to be the extreme opposite. And as an artist that is trying to be so colorful, I think this is why I find myself in the heart of this place. But so this is this is Herzl Street, right? This is Herzl Street, and it's actually just near one of the biggest pieces we got of Dede and its own means. It's quite amazing. Come and see. All right. So this is actually one of my favorite walks, and it's actually huge. 
This belonged to two of the most famous artists in Israel. You can see the signature Dede, and in Hebrew, Nitzan means. Now, this is a romantic story. Nitzan means a girl. She's one of the first poet, street poets in Israel. Not keeping it to the drawer, let's put it on the wall and share with people everything I want, everything I think. And you can see over there, there's the poem that made from a specific font that represent her. That means every artist choose a certain font or an image to represent him. Also Dede, the boyfriend that she met in the middle of the street while she was spraying, Dede, I can recognize him because you can see this hand that holding balloons and we got like a bandaid on it. Bandaid is the signature, is the tag. That means every time I can see the image of a bandaid, I know we're talking about Dede Bandit. So you know, Nero, I noticed that the poem that she wrote, yes. it sounds like there's something something about violence. When we broke up, I, I ran home, I hurried home, and I was afraid of all the objects in the house like I've never been worried before. Exactly. And what, what is amazing. What are they talking about? In 2020, this is a wall for the violence against women. Wow. And especially that was really sensitive in 2020, maybe the awareness. So we have all the names of some of the victims in this story. And as you read the poem, it's talking about being really extra afraid in the house. This is another piece of talking about the inside the house because we know that a lot of the violence with women, it's the husband and the tension. So that adding with one piece and then people adding another and another. And again, this is what's so amazing about the street art. It's changed every day, every night to whatever happened in the news. And it's amazing the contrast also, the black and white and then boom, the color, like that's all picturesque and beautiful. Exactly, and you can see the type and the style of every artist. This is one image, just like a painting. This is a 3D. This is now popping up from the wall, and this is the new method of the new life today. How can I make myself more creative? Wow, what is this place? Nero, where are we? Okay, you can also hear the sound. We're gonna get far away. This is actually the industrial area. And it's quite amazing because you're gonna walk here in a second. You can see the beautiful murals and images we got all over the wall. But actually, it started as a graffiti. Graffiti. So wait, what's the difference between graffiti and street art? Great question. Graffiti is what we know as the old school. The writing on the wall of the gangs and actually a lot of text and tag, which they are the signature of the artist. This is the beginning of everything. Later on, with technology in 21st century, now we call this world the street art. It's like an umbrella that underneath, and you can see, we have all around between murals to um, a pasting a poster and walls on the wall. Wait, do people live here as well? Yes, this is actually one of the coolest place to rent in the Because I can see it's over, all the all the walls are color are painted. Yes, but there's, here it's very nice. It's clean. There's like a respect. It's all inside. It's clean mm -hmm. and beautiful and redesigned. It seems like there's a nice conversation, though, between the street artists and the people who live here. You're right, because it's a, become a community area. Mm -hmm. So now the street artists also doing it, but they have kind of like, um, you know, a bit of um, politeness, maybe not to do it on the wall and not upsetting you. But here, as you can see, this building is supposed to be destroyed. This is a story of gentrification. And the gray law say that you like to paint on the wall if it's supposed to be destroyed. But all the new building in the neighborhood that you're gonna see in the new Florentine, this is now not allowed to be painted on and the graffiti over there is completely illegal. Okay, so this is probably one of the most picturesque uh, pieces of art that I know here in Florentine. It's totally a great place totally. for a selfie, right? Totally selfie. Yeah, but that's not why we're here. No, we're not. I prefer to show you something a bit of interesting. And this is something that I did just to show you a different perspective. <clears throat> as an Israeli artist and as a Jewish guy that lives in Tel Aviv, it was very important for me to show this tension between the Jewish land, right, the only Jewish state living around the world, to the capitalism or the high-tech nation and what Israel is all celebrated about. So we got two icons that are very, very easy for the Israel to recognize and a lot of Jews around the world. We got the hay right. for God, God and we got the shekels, the currency in Israel. But we can see the transformation of the gradient actually that is all the time playing what is the base of what? Is it from God on top and then he gives you the materialistic life of money or maybe this is the only uh, state of the Jews that we need a lot of money to hold it and to make it what it is and it's not just talking about the God or oh, it is. What is really happening here that you can find yourself 
on the spectrum of whatever point you are. Are you more Israeli or are you more Jewish or there isn't actually? Or, or what exactly is Israeli? Can this be Israeli or is this Jewish? I mean, how do Exactly, you... you don't really can define if there is actually Israeli Jewish because now it's totally mixed from what we did when we built the nation. It's all about um, um, uh, taking technology to the next level and, and showing the light from Zion, right? But we understand that we're not longer only Jewish as the concept was. This is a whole kind of society that we are start to be a bit more tolerant and open-minded about it. You know, it's amazing, Nero. So many times I've been to this neighborhood with you in groups. Never once did I ever see you point out anything that you ever made. And it's making me feel like I can say whatever I want, use my chutzpah, not having my censorship, and actually just make people think. This is Karen. She's actually been in my class in school. Uh, she's taking the most famous English song, but she write it in Hebrew, so it looks like Yiddish, basically. This why I say, here comes the Ryan again, <laughs> but it's actually English. So English, Hebrew, bridges across traditions and cultures. Listen, Nero, this has been great. Really, Thank thanks so much. much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy your walk. See you in the streets. <laughs> All right. Thank so you know what's interesting about these graffiti walks or street art is that every day they change and what you're seeing is what people are feeling. We could spend hours just analyzing each of the images, which we won't, but if you want in the future we can try that as well. I do want to move along because there are a few other places I'd like to take you. In particular, one of the markets in Tel Aviv. It's not the Carmel market, which a lot of people are familiar with, but a much more of a, I would say, a working class uh, market. Uh, you know, if, if, if the Carmel market has become upscale, that tells you where we are right now, but the food is delicious. Let's look around here on Levinsky Street, where our guide is. Just around the corner and down the block from where we are right now is the original sand dune. It's no longer a sand dune, but it was a sand dune back in 1909 when the city of Tel Aviv was founded. It's also right at the location where the state of Israel was founded on May 14th in 1948. But that's a story for another day. Right now we're located on a street called Levinsky Street. This street is one of the first streets in the city of Tel Aviv. Within about a decade and a half, this street was already up and running in the mid-1920s. And it was the heart and soul of the workers' area. This is where they would come, well, to get their food. Until today, Levinsky Street, which is part of the Neve Shanan neighborhood and continues towards the Florentine neighborhood of the city of Tel Aviv, is, well, as you can tell, a working-class neighborhood and a working-class street. And where we are right now on Levinsky Street is the heart and soul of the street, what is locally known as Shuk Levinsky, the Levinsky market, as you can see, looks a little different than, well, some of the other markets you might think of when you think about Israel, like Machane Yehuda or the Carmel market. It's, well, it's a living and breathing place, and recently they've actually just closed it off so that we can have a pedestrian area, even though we're in the midst of a, a little bit of a crazy time. Usually it would actually even be more busy than what it is right now, but because of the reality at this point in December of 2020, well, things are a little bit more subdued, but as you can tell, not by much. This is where people are going to come and get the best food that Tel Aviv has to offer. Not just you and me who are going to buy some burekas for our home, but this is where restaurants are going to come for the finest in the delis or the spices and a whole array of things that you can only imagine. Now, the city itself, which was born out of the waves of immigration that are going to be coming in the aftermath of the third Aliyah, the third wave of immigration into the fourth Aliyah of the 1920s are, among other things, going to include Jews who arrive from Greece and from the Balkans in general. And as time goes on, we will see that the cornerstone of this street has Jews who have arrived from Greece and from Turkey and from Persia and from Iraq and from Libya and from Georgia and from, well, all over the Jewish world. And not necessarily the Jewish world that we sometimes think about when we think about the old country. And what we're going to try and do today is go to one, two or three different places where we can taste some of the food, but more important, we can meet the people. Okay, so I thought maybe we'd go to and meet two of the vendors and taste their food. And we'll be in Shuk Levinsky for about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. Mashuk has something like that. Uh, so why don't we go to our first stop. 
Oh, by the way, when Hebrew is spoken back and forth between me and the folks that I meet, there's also subtitles. So hopefully you'll, they'll be clear. If not, I'm always happy to tell you what we said. We're about to enter into a deli called Chaim Raphael. Chaim Raphael is the grandfather who started this along with his wife, Esther. But we're going to meet some of the family. Hopefully they're not too busy and we'll taste what they have to offer. Shalom lekulam. Ma shalom. So I just want, oh, you know what, we're inside, so I'm going to put my mask back on here. So right now we're in Chaim Raphael's place, and we actually have the whole family, and it's, we're fortunate, it's early enough, it's not too busy. I was here earlier in the week, and it was crazy, I couldn't even speak to them. But who we have here, we can start with Sadiq over there, and Shlomi, and over here we have Chaim. So Chaim, Chaim Raphael, same name. Uh, the place isn't named after him, but it's actually named after his grandfather, after Tzadik's father. Where's your grandfather from? Wow. Um, and Chaim, how long have you been working here? You can see the sparkle in his eye when he spoke about his grandfather. I think that's one of the things that makes Chaim Raphael's place so special because you really feel that. Aside from people and food, what else was he passionate about? <laughs> So, uh, Chaim, what do we have here? What are we looking at? And what are other things besides olives that I see that you have cured here? Wait, those are eggplants over there? Oh, can I taste one? All right, so we have these, these were eggplants. This, okay, this is a small eggplant, I guess. Oh my God. Wow, that is really good. And uh, what uh, and you, What else do we have? Let's see. Any hot peppers? Hot peppers and olives. Wow. Very, very hot. Whoa. Wow. Uh, should I do this on camera? I'm not sure. Let's try it. Okay. It's got some kick to it. Um, we're gonna. That's enough for now. I think. Do you do it all by yourself, or do you send it somewhere? Uh, 
כל ההחמצות האלה שאנחנו עושים בהחמצות, וכמו שלמדנו בבית, בסגנון הבלקני. הרבה אהבה והרבה תשומת לב. A lot of love, a lot of attention. Okay, got it. So in addition to the oil and the vinegar and the water that you put in the jar, you also need the love and attention and so on. So besides the olives, what kind of cheese do we have? So can we taste that one? Let's see the... Oh, for, oh wow, great. Okay, let's see. This one. וואו. שהוא נקרא סופו, זה קצת צפונית לסלוניקי, במחלבה קטנה מאוד, מאוד תעשייתית, דברים מאוד מאוד מיוחדים שהם עושים. וואו, אז אתה עושה את הכל מהכל, זה באמת מדהים. תראו, הדבר האחרון שאני רוצה לשאול אותך, לפני שנגיע, ואני באמת, זה מדהים, אני אוהב לבוא לכאן. היי שלומי, מה נשמע? היי שלומי, מה נשמע? Is Shlomi make salmon now? So, what are you going to do? He's going to salt the salmon? And then salmon, which is like a kid of the sheep, which is like a kid of the sheep, which is like a kid of the sheep. Chaim, so I know that your grandfather, Chaim, wasn't just concerned about food, but also speaking to young people. As a survivor giving testimony, but he also organized the neighborhood with music. What, what kind of music? What is it? What is it? Oh, he's going to be saying in Ladino, right? Because, of course, he's Sephardic, and that's where they came from. That was the tradition. Do you sing in Ladino as well? No, you're not going to sing for us? Okay, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. Maybe next time we'll get, uh, we'll get Chaim to sing for us. So, Chaim, to the Rabbah, Tzadik, to the Rabbah, Lecha. So that was Chaim Sr. That was the grandfather singing. And up until a few years ago, he used to sit in the shop and he would sometimes sing or speak with groups. Really a very, very special man. But there is actually one more person I'd like you to meet in the market. Uh, we had some food. It's time for dessert. So why not? Yeah. Before you go to that, just a quick question. It, it does strike me as an amazing thing that you walk around and so many Israelis come from other places. You know, we're not used to this. I mean, we're used to our grandparents, our great grand, you know, but it feels like many of us are, are more removed where, you know, now we have this Balkan history, this family from Saloniki. Um, and, and I mean, that that's really what it's like, right? Everybody's parents or grandparent came from somewhere else. We're all from somewhere. I mean, there are the families that have seven, eight, nine generations in right. Jerusalem also. That's right. Yes, absolutely. We are a nation of immigrants. Right. And, and can you just, uh, I know I'm, uh, we didn't plan this very quickly. Could I know you, we talked about last time that your dad um, was an American, right? Who made Aliyah, um, who is the dean of HUC, my, my teacher and mentor. Can you, where is your mom's family from? My mom's from Uruguay. Uh, my parents actually met here in, after, right after the Six Day War. My dad was during HUC. Uh, my mom had come to make Aliyah. She was uh, from a secular Zionist youth movement. She left uh, university and decided to come here, was, gonna, was in a kibbutz in the Jordan Valley, was going to go up to the Golan Heights, decided to go to Jerusalem to finish her degree. She met my dad at a party. <laughs> they fell in love, got married here, uh, stayed an extra year. Then they went back to the States for my dad to finish rabbinical school. They always wanted to come back. And in 1981, they did. It's, and that's, that's kind, it's a great story. And that's kind of typical in Israel, you know, where you kind of like have this uh, great mashup of cultures and backgrounds. And, um, and then you come together. It's really wonderful and something that I think um, a lot of people who may not spend so much time in Israel, they just think Israelis, oh, they're Israeli, you know, but like everybody really is not so far removed from someplace else. It is, it is truly, while America is a country of immigrants, Israel is so much short term closer to that um, than we are. Anyway, go ahead with your tour. For, I just wanted to raise For, for sure, ahead. I would say that on the one hand, that's a symbol of, of, as you said before, all of Israel is responsible for each other. On the other hand, it also allows us a deeper understanding of why we're always at each other's throats. Meaning that embrace, sometimes a bear hug can hurt. 
<laughs> but uh, let's keep going. It's like uh, being cousins, right? It's like you're a little too close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I got gotcha. you. Uh, I'm very excited about our next stop. This way. Okay, uh, so, so hey, I, I see here that not all of the ice cream is out yet. Friday yes. was very busy, wasn't it? Yes. So we're, now we're still replenishing what was all eaten already on Friday. Very nice. Before we continue about the ice cream, <laughs> so wait, so you, you, you started your business two months ago? ago in the height of Corona? Yes, we need to continue to live, 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 It was a very hard job, but it sounds to me that if you opened up this ice cream place in the middle of Corona, that hard work doesn't seem to scare you. No. No, that's for no. sure. But you so, so in order to live, you have to work, and, and it's ephemeral, very nice. But you know, you said that the restaurant was Persian food. So is this, a, is this Persian ice cream? I have two Persian ice cream. Yes, Wow, so this, so you know what, we're going to get to the ice cream in just a second. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Iran. You're from Iran. When, yeah. did, you, when did you arrive in Israel? When did you make Aliyah? I came to Israel in 1979. So it was right, is it right before the revolution or right after? Exactly after. Exactly after? Yes. Oh my goodness. It's and you uh, came? It's just the uh, beginning and the... Uh, and, and then you came. So and here you came, yes. Yeah. Wow. There were still trains. It was between the last trains. So, you know, sometimes when people leave the old country, they leave it behind and they're just here. But do you have memories of Iran sure. as a child? Sure. I was uh, at Arbaisre. You were 14 years 14, old when you left. Yes, I came here. And you still write it. 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 And this particular kind of ice cream, are there people who are originally from Iran who come here yes. and are looking for a taste of the old yes. country? Yes. Who were so excited. Is that true? Very, very, very. All the Iran, the Jews of Iran, who have been able to do this again, עוד לפני המהפכה, או שבתקופה שהם עוד חיו בפרס, אהבו את הטעם הזה, ולא זוכים לעשות טיול בפרס בחזרה, בשביל להרגיש את הטעמים הקולינריים שאפשר. אני מאוד שמחה שאני מממשת להם את האפשרות לבוא, לאכול, ליהנות ולהיזכר. Wow, that is amazing. So not being able to do a culinary tour of their home country, yeah. now living in their other home country, they have memories of their other home exactly. country. Exactly. And it's yeah. this brings it all alive. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think that the ice cream is a great example of the fact that we have roots in so many different places, and we are, in fact, the sum total of all of the parts. Exactly. Well, I've never been to Iran, but would it be okay if I tasted the Persian ice cream? Sure, you. Excellent. So while you're giving me this, what other flavors do you have here? Is it a Uh, menta. You have mint chocolate. Uh, uh, coffee espresso. Wow, white chocolate caramel. espresso, caramel pecan. French vanilla, passiflora, passion fruit. Wow. But you know what? The, I'm going to go with the, the Persian Bastani Palsi. Oh, Bastani, that's the name of the, the ice cream place. What, is, what does Bastani mean? Bastani means glida. That means ice cream. Ice cream in Palsi. In Persian. Wow. This is with zafran. Wow, with zafran. Maybe it's pistachio, it has rose water, saffron. Yes. Wow, unbelievable. Okay, All right, here we go. Whoa. People are very, very happy to eat. Oh, my goodness. You, you have to try this. Oh, wait, no, it doesn't work that way. Sorry. Okay. 
When you come back, this is where this is going to be our first stop. We'll start with dessert. Why not? Wow, this is great. And uh, Sohela, what, what is the, your name, Sohela, mean? Sohela is Parsit, In Persian, Sohela is Klilut, which is somebody who is lighthearted, who doesn't take things too heavily. Yes. Zoremet. You go with the flow. Yes. Well, listen. If you, if you, if you took yourself into your own hands and started this in the middle of Corona, I get it. Yeah. And the ice cream is delicious. Thank you. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for you too. Thank you. Oh wait, how do you say thank you in Persian? Mamnun. Mamnun. Yeah. Mamnun. All right. Well, listen, the ice cream was really delicious. Now, there's actually two short stops that I'd like to show you before we before we open it up to questions. Or so I'm just gonna, yeah. Sorry to interrupt again. Um, yes, I'm making it a habit. Um, just uh, can you um, for those of us who are, are really kind of into this ice cream now is like we're it's on the we're feeling it. We want to taste it. How different is that ice cream from what like a regular glida in Israel, regular ice cream, even you find in America? Could you still Sorry. remember the taste? Yes, so I can tell you the saffron was very heightened. You could really, again, I don't know how to describe saffron, but people who know, uh, as well as the rose water. You know, you maybe you've, you've been in restaurants where they've handed, you know, the, uh, uh, ethnic restaurants where you kind of feel it and you can smell it. It almost, it smelled like that when you were eating it. And the pistachios, of course, was, was very, it was like bits of pistachio in it. So it was really, uh, it was Delicious. very good. Different, very different. Not what you expect, but it was very, very good. Great. All right. So we've landed now in what was once called Kings of Israel Square. Uh, today is called Rabin Square. Uh, this is the city hall in Tel Aviv. It's a famous square for, for, for decades and decades. In 1977, when Maccabi Tel Aviv basketball won the European basketball championship, uh, this square was filled and people were jumping into the fountain over here. It's just a sporting match, and yet it was David and Goliath all over again. But I digress. I've actually brought you here, not for any real depth, meaning we're not going to spend a lot of time, only about a minute or so. But this is reflective. If we started at Mount Herzl, we talked about the greatness of Theodor Herzl and the visionary that he was. You know what? This is a living and breathing place with lots of wonderful wonders that we've been able to achieve and terrible moments of our own doing. This is one example, and I'll just, we'll be here together in the square. So this is the square, and if you remember on November 4th, 1995, there was a rally that you see here that was for peace and against violence, and Rabin and Shimon Peres were on the stage, and celebrities went up here on the platform looking out at the crowds that were shoulder to shoulder, about 200, 300,000 in the streets and in the square. That's Rabin there singing a song for peace. And then when the rally was over, behind the stage, there were these stairs coming down and the entourage's vehicles were waiting. Now, all of this area was blocked off, shoulder to shoulder in the streets. Shimon Peres stops for a moment, will then walk up to the car that pulls up. This was a, a roadway, it was an alleyway back then. And then right over where these people are sitting, there was an urban planter. And there was, I, I pause it for a second, a young man by the name of Yigal Amir, who was pretending to be one of the drivers uh, and was a Jewish law student from Bar Ilan University who was prepared to assassinate the Prime Minister of Israel. Rabin comes down after Paris, after Leah Rabin, his wife. Leah gets into the car. Rabin pauses for a moment, looking out at the crowds. It was a very difficult time, no question. A lot of violence in the streets. There were buses blowing up left and right because of Hamas and other Palestinian terrorist organizations. And there were a lot of anti-Rabin protests by Jews and lots of... Uh, screaming in the streets against him and threats being made against him. And that's when Yigal Yamir gets up behind him and will ultimately, again, I'm not going to get into all the details, but you remember the, the, four, the three shots which eventually will murder Rabin. And the reason I point this out is because you should know that that was a period of time where a generation of us 
who had finished the army uh, maybe before university, before marriage, after our trips around the world, we're ready to give back the keys and say, thank you very much, we're done. This isn't where we're gonna raise our kids. And then we took a deep breath and we realized we need to be the change. This wasn't the Israel that represented who we were or who we, what we wanted. Now we have to recognize, of course, that this path towards peace with the Palestinian, regardless of one finds themselves on the left or on the right politically, is not clear. It's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's complex. And that we don't practice peace or the attempts for peace within a laboratory wearing white gloves and we try and experiment. If it doesn't work, we try something else. There's real ramifications if it doesn't work. And yet this was a moment in time. It was a watershed moment, if you ask me, in the annals of the Jewish people, not just the state of Israel. We were different people before and a different people after. And we, well, many of us decided not to give back the keys, but in fact, to do our best to create a better place. I think the last stop that we're going to stop at, it too was a watershed moment in the annals of the Jewish people. And we've now landed on Herzl Street and the corner of Rothschild Boulevard. And what we're gonna do in a very short time and then we'll wrap it up is make our way to that Mount Sinai-esque moment that occurred here in the city of Tel Aviv. In the mid-1880s, the first Jews are leaving that ancient city of Jaffa and creating what would become the first Jewish suburb in the land of Israel, maybe even in the world, Nevei Tzedek. By the beginning of the 20th century, already needing to expand, those Jews are going to gather themselves, turn to the Ottoman Turks, say, we want to purchase those sand dunes just south of Jaffa, and the Ottomans say, fine by us. Ultimately, in the year 1909, 66 families are going to leave Nevei Tzedek and come and stand actually where we're standing right now. And they will gather for a lotto, a lottery. And they will have sent the kids down to the shore to collect shells, dark shells and light shells. And they'll write the names of the families on one and the plot numbers on the other. And they'll choose in this way, they'll distribute all the plots of land. And of those who are choosing at this lotto is going to be a gentleman by the name of Mayor Dizengoff. Now, Mayor's mother knew what he was going to be when he grew up because Mayor became the first what of the city of Tel Aviv? The first mayor, of course. Not only that, it's known that he liked to ride around on his female horse. What's a female horse? A mayor. So Mayor, Mayor Dizengoff. You can't make this stuff up. Anyway. We know that Mayor Dizengoff is going to choose and his plot of land is actually going to be right over here. Now, I know that building doesn't look like much now. It's actually going through some renovations. And in a moment, we'll recognize that beyond it being the very first house that will be built here on this sand dune, which actually turns into a main boulevard, which becomes the first main boulevard of the city of Tel Aviv to be called Rothschild Street. Beyond that, that home will have a historic moment in time that in a sense will be the watershed moment in modern times for the Jewish people. We'll get to that in a moment. And as you can imagine, the guy you saw on the horse, well, indeed, that is Mayor Dizengoff on his mayor. 
Now, that group of people that starts that city in 1909 will first be called Achuzat Bait, or let's say a homestead. They will soon change that name to become known as Tel Aviv. So why Tel Aviv? Where does that come from? Well, that brings us to our friend Theodore Herzl. Back in 1897, convening the first World Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, it will be there that he will say, actually right after it's done, if not in five years, definitely in 50 years, there'll be a Jewish state. He says that in 1897, 1947, the UN says yes to a partition plan, 50 years to the year. Was he a prophet, a visionary? Did he just get lucky? Well, maybe a little bit of all the above. At the beginning of the 20th century, he writes this novel called Alt Neuland. Alt Neuland in German, Old New Land. It's a novel in which he envisions travelers who are arriving after 20 years of not being in the land of Israel, and they arrive to a Jewish state that they just don't recognize. That book will be translated to Hebrew, and the Hebrew title of that book will be called Tel Aviv, Old New Land, Archaeological Tell, layer upon layer upon layer of history, and Aviv, Springtime, something brand new, something very old and very new, and so Tel Aviv is born. Now, this home, while being a pillar of the city of Tel Aviv, as is Rothschild Boulevard, the antithesis of what could be found in Jaffa or even in Nevei Tzedek, would be in fact the pillar of that changed community that would grow into what became a vibrant community of Tel Aviv. This home in the 1930s will be donated by Mayor Dizengoff to the city of Tel Aviv to become the first art museum of Tel Aviv in the aftermath of the death of his, his beloved wife, Tina. But in 1948, in that moment of time, the War of Independence has already begun and the British are about to leave. There'll be a moment in time in which, once again, this building will play a significant role in modern times for the Jewish people. We were a different people before the events that took place in this building, and we will be a different people after the events. In that building, we will be transformed when... Three hundred invited guests were brought to this room to witness the birth of the state of Israel. On May 14th, 1948, Friday afternoon, 4 p.m., David Ben-Gurion got up on that podium and took his gavel and banged three times and began an event that would change the history of the Jewish people. Within 32 minutes, the whole event was over. Ben-Gurion had read the Declaration of Independence, and as though from the heavens, Hatikva, the hope, the national anthem of the state of Israel, came down. I know it sounds very poetic, but there was actually no room for the orchestra, so they stuck him on the second floor. But whether our exodus from Egypt or the declaration that took place in this room, it was exactly that hope, that tikva, which has driven the Jewish people to constantly yearn to return to their homeland as free people. After reading the Declaration of Independence, David Ben-Gurion says, long live the state of Israel. And he says, this meeting is adjourned. He walks out. He walks out because he knows the war of independence is going to continue now, shifting from an internal war against the local Arabs who were living in what was previously called Palestine to a war with all of Israel, now the state of Israel's neighbors. A long and powerful story and yet it was the moment that took place in what is perhaps one of the least impressive looking buildings in that one of the most impressive moments took place so in, in a full day of touring we were able to peel back layers so on the one hand witness the sight of where those pilgrims would come into the land and yet also the site where our biblical ancestry was rooted in the ancient port of Jaffa. We were able to meet Jews from around the world and not necessarily from the old country that we sometimes associate with and taste their food. We clearly got a hand on the pulse of where Tel Avivis are at or at least where Nero is at as he walked us through 
and we're able to engage with what we're thinking on the wall, not the wall in Jerusalem, of course, but in Tel Aviv, a real canvas of sorts. And while we've achieved incredible things here, there's a lot that we have where we're paying for, we're, we're, we're pained by, whether it's the events that took place up north in Mount Meron, this terrible accident that took place, could it have been prevented? That will be a question that we're going to be asking ourselves and struggling. And of course, Rabin assassination. Obviously, obviously, we're not perfect. And yet hopefully we can internalize that we aren't a fairy tale land, but a living and breathing place. And we do our best to engage with the real place in order to create or perhaps strengthen the relationships to create a real love and not some kind of infatuation. It's an ongoing mission every day. But then again, if it wasn't, well, it'd be boring. So thank you very much. Uh, and are Great. there any questions? Great. Well, first of all, we want to give you a big um, todaroba. Um, Nifla me'achuz, ezech avaya, great experience. Thank you so much. Um, you really take us up close and personal, um, and that's a special opportunity for us, um, not just the usual um, Israel tour. So we really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna have to sort of roll off in a minute, but um, if there's any um, if there's any uh, questions that are that are pressing, you can put it in the chat. Uh, if you can unmute if, if you want for a moment. Um, and um, as you're thinking, and you do not have to come up with a question if you don't have one, I would just ask you this question, um, taking us through Tel Aviv was was very powerful. Oh yeah, good. There's your email address that Ori put into the uh, chat. So feel free. Um, Ori likes to stay in touch with uh, friends. And so, uh, you know, now you are friends. Um, so just know you have, uh, you have a friend in Israel and hopefully at some point we'll be able to actually um, take a trip um, with Ori, and then you could taste the ice cream yourself. Um, but <laughs> um, taking us through Israel, um, taking us through Tel Aviv is, is very impactful. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about um, the, the contrast between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv is, is, is really um, incredible. Um, and I guess the, the one thing I wanted to ask as a Reform Jew, um, as you are, and we are, and so we have this in common, do you feel like in Israel there is more kind of acknowledgement, recognition, or more embracing of an ordinary Israeli who may have turned off to, uh, you know, perhaps a more um, uh, observant Judaism or, or more, um, um, you know, orthodoxy and, and may have found this place in Reform Judaism? Do you feel like the, the sort of the presence of Reform Judaism has grown? in Israel or just non-Orthodox Judaism in general as an option for people to engage religiously on their own terms? So I think that, uh, first of all, yes and yes. Meaning I think that while it, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't distinguish that you can find it in Tel Aviv, not that you were saying this, but that you can find it in Tel Aviv and not find it in Jerusalem. I think that both Jerusalem and Tel Aviv has of the other as well. Um, but if we look at the last several years, we know there's been an immense growth in Israelis. In fact, 13% of Israelis have identified, who are polled as Jewish Israelis, who have been polled of how do you define yourself. In Israel, we are not shy both sharing what we think and also asking what you think. Uh, you know, you, within, within two minutes of meeting somebody, oh, you're a lawyer? How much you make? You know, that kind of thing so that we're, we're happy to share. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, 13% have identified as progressive Jews, of which the majority, 9 or 10%, reform and the remainder conservative. So there is a growth much more than just a decade ago. Uh, you're also, however, seeing the growth of a spirituality within Judaism that's being tapped into by those who don't necessarily define themselves as orthodox or traditional in any way. You see this in music already from the 80s. We're seeing this meshing of Israeli rock and, and liturgy. <clears throat> Whether it's people like Kobe Oz, who were perhaps one of the forerunners of this, or even today, Israel's hottest pop star 
is uh, Omer Adam. We heard him singing before about Tel Aviv. So again, meshing different mm -hmm. uh, liturgy, Jewish traditional liturgy within popular music. And you've seen others as well along the way tapping into that. And there's immense growth in communities such as Beit Tfila Israeli, the, the Israeli house of prayer, or our version of IHOP, as it were, uh, in that it's not a reform or conservative congregation, but rather an Israeli congregation that meets on Friday afternoons in the summer on the port of Tel Aviv and a sister community in Jerusalem and other, and other cities as well that includes music and a combination of what might be familiar to reform and conservative crowds, but also Israeli poetry and, and music, etc. So yes, there is that growth. Now, what I think that reflects nicely, or at least juxtaposes itself to the, the, the world in which Nero grew up, which is why I asked him where he comes from. He talked about his parents and their fear of even saying Kiddush. And all Nero wanted, he said, it's about the mishpacha, it's about the family and the chicken. Uh, so that, that I think that there, there's a reason that only 13% identify as progressive Jews, whereas in America, as you know, or North America, the largest, uh, the largest stream of Jewish um, uh, community. Mm. We can get into why that was, we won't do it now, but with the birth of Zionism, and the second wave of Zionism, of labor Zionism, which was also like Reform Judaism was going to be a reflection of not, not letting go of Judaism, but re-harnessing what it meant, labor Zionism was going to do the same, which would be the foundation on which secular Israeli Jewish yeah. identity was born. Interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it was interesting that Nero said like they were afraid to do kiddush. Like, was it the fear of saying kiddush that that they were going to lose their sort of grounding as secular Jews, or was it more like oh they didn't want to uh, you know tread onto like more you know to to this very sacred ritual and lifestyle that they weren't consistent in doing every day. Well, wow. interesting, interesting observation. I would say the former rather than the latter in that there was such a, and there still is, but more so in the past of this notion of, I don't do Jewish. They do Jewish. Mm -hmm. I'm Israeli. Yeah. It's mutually exclusive, right? It's it, like you're either one or you're the other. And Uri really lives in the world of, you can do both. You can, you can be, you know, and, and, you know, he's part of Yotzma. I mean, I don't want to tell you how you're feeling, but I think I would say those who, who attend a Reform congregation consider themselves religious in some sense. And, you know, maybe not the most observant, but there's a lot of Reform Jews in America, as you know, Uri, who would say, religious? Oh, I'm not religious. And I'll, I'll tell them, I said, well, you come to synagogue every Friday night. And uh, I see you learning every week. Oh, but Rabbi, I'm not religious. So that's a whole nother conversation, right? But um, if you ever um, come to Israel and you want to see a reform service and be with the reform Jewish community, I know Yozma would be happy to have you um, come attend services um, in Modi'in, so, uh, which we've done before as well. Ori, this has been a joy. Thank you so much. Um, there was one comment that said that, you know, you're better than Stanley Tucci, who did this whole series on CNN going through Italy and tasting <laughs> all the foods. So um, we really do appreciate it. We, we hope we can do this again, um, perhaps on Zoom, but even better in person, um, which we would absolutely love. So um, hopefully um, um, in, in due time, um, we'll be able to do that. Please stay safe, be well. Um, send regards to your family from Fairmount Temple family. I will and, for sure and give to your family as well, Rabbi Josh. Will do and um, say hello to Eretz Israel and that uh, we, uh, we are um, uh, Ohavi, Ohavi we are lovers of Zion with all its complexities and, um, and uh, we look forward to seeing the next chapters unfold in the state of Israel and certainly for you, um, Lihitarot. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Have everybody a wonderful can, Everybody up. can unmute if you want to say goodbye to Uri. Goodbye, and thank you. Absolutely <laughs> fabulous. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Your feet. Thanks, Excellent. everyone. Thank you, Uri. Very thank interesting. Uh, Pleasure. Janice, say hi to my friends.
Oh, she left. Okay. Oh, no, she's there. Say hi to Thank you. And I left out uh, Miriam Brody. Would love to see pictures of your daughter. She was almost <laughs> crying when I told her about them. <laughs> everyone loves you in Boston. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 And thank you all for joining us. It's good to see you, Bert. Thank you. See you, Bert and Carol and Aida. Good thank to you. see you, everybody. And Louise, Bill and Tom and Sheila. Bye. 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 and Jamie, Beverly, good to see you, Carol. You. <laughs> Pleasure. Take care, everybody. Be well.